today, let's pivot our attention towards a crucial aspect, the T-Wave. Just as we've dissected the mysteries of the ST segment, we're now primed to unravel the enigma of the T-Wave together. So, what exactly is the T-Wave, and why is it significant? Picture this. After the frenetic activity of the QRS complex subsides, the T-Wave emerges as a tranquil phase, akin to the calm seas post-storm. It signifies the repolarization of the ventricles, a phase where they reset and prepare for the next cycle of cardiac activity. During the T-Wave, the ventricles are undergoing repolarization, the process of restoring their electrical charge after contraction. To truly grasp the behavior of the T-Wave on an electrocardiogram, it's essential to delve into the intricate process of repolarization within the heart. To truly understand repolarization, we need to understand the T-Wave on the ECG, I mean ding-dong. Well, during repolarization, myocardial cells undergo a series of electrical changes that enable them to recharge and return to their resting state. This process involves the movement of ions across the cell membrane, particularly potassium ions moving out of the cell. All right, you might be wondering, where does this potassium inside the cell come from? Well, it mainly comes from the extracellular space, which is essentially the blood. Now, what happens when there's a higher concentration of potassium in the blood? More potassium moves out, you know, from lower concentration to higher concentration through osmosis and stuff. Clear? All right, I'm elaborating on it just to make sure we're on the same page. So, imagine you have a higher concentration of potassium in the bloodstream. This could happen due to various factors, such as dietary intake, medication effects, or certain medical conditions. Now, as we know, nature tends to balance things out, right? So, when there's a higher concentration of potassium in the blood compared to inside the cells, potassium ions will naturally want to move from an area of lower concentration inside the cells to an area of higher concentration in the blood. This movement occurs through a process called osmosis, where water follows the flow of ions to maintain equilibrium. As a result, more potassium ions will move out of the cells into the bloodstream to equalize the concentration gradient. This process helps regulate the balance of potassium ions both inside and outside the cells. So when there's a higher concentration of potassium in the blood, it triggers a movement of potassium ions out of the cells, ensuring that the overall balance is maintained. But there is a problem. This results in repolarization with much higher intensity than normal. That is a rapid and exaggerated repolarization. Consequently, we observe peaked T waves on the ECG during hyperkalemia. Make sense? Moving on, what if there is hypokalemia? In hypokalemia, there's a shortage of potassium ions available for cellular function. This leads to delayed or impaired repolarization of cardiac cells. On the ECG, hypokalemia typically shows flattened or inverted T waves. The reduced availability of potassium ions slows down the repolarization process, resulting in changes in the T wave morphology. Additionally, Hypokalemia may also lead to other ECG changes, such as prolongation of the QT interval and the appearance of U waves. But wait, why the prolongation of the QT interval? As for the prolonged QT interval, that's correct. It's due to delayed repolarization. Essentially, with low potassium levels, it takes more time for the ventricles to repolarize fully. This elongates the interval between the beginning of ventricular depolarization, Q wave, and the end of repolarization, T wave, on the ECG. Perfect. Moving on to the next part. What if there is myocardial ischemia or an infraction? The changes in T waves observed in acute myocardial infarction and myocardial ischemia occur due to alterations in the repolarization patterns of cardiac cells in response to ischemic injury. Here's why these changes happen. In the early stages of AMI, there's a rapid and intense repolarization of cardiac cells in the affected area. This can lead to tall and peaked T waves, known as 
hyperacute T waves. These tall T waves indicate acute myocardial injury and are often among the earliest signs of MI on the ECG. As the ischemic injury progresses and myocardial damage worsens, the repolarization patterns in the affected area become increasingly abnormal. Eventually, the T waves may invert, signaling ongoing ischemia and injury to the myocardium. T wave inversion is commonly observed in the later stages of AMI and may persist even after the acute event has subsided. In ischemia, where there's insufficient oxygen supply to a portion of the heart muscle, the repolarization patterns of cardiac cells are also affected. T wave changes in ischemia may include T wave inversion, which occurs due to abnormal repolarization patterns in the ischemic area. The altered repolarization can lead to changes in the shape and morphology of the T waves on the ECG, reflecting the ischemic insult to the myocardium. Keep in mind, folks, that this information is incredibly vital for comprehending the stages of myocardial infarction in our 30-day ECG challenge. Wait, what are the phases of ST elevation MI I'm talking about? Exactly, the hyperacute, acute, and chronic phases and how they manifest on the ECG. Click here to learn more.